Hello kids, Shubhamangalam Athletic Scholars, myself Sudeep. I will be taking class 8 physics chapter 1 force and I have also mentioned the page number, it's page number 7. In the previous video we were discussing about muscular force which is one kind of contact force. So we came to a conclusion that to perform a certain task we need to use the muscles of our body. Only then it is called as muscular force like you know squeezing a toothpaste, holding the marker and writing on the board, picking up a suitcase and there were many other examples that I discussed like digging a bowl well, exercising, running and all these activities your muscles are being used up. So what do you understand? What is a muscle? A muscle is nothing but a group of muscle cells. So while one is expanding, the other is contracting. Look at the first point mentioned over here that we need to, you know, ponder about. Observing the changes in any uh, muscle while working. So here we need to understand this. What does it mean? So here, for example, if I'm throwing a ball, okay, I'm taking my hand backwards and then throwing the ball forward. So, uh, the shoulders on the front end are going to expand while on the back end they are going to contract. That is what I am trying to explain. Uh, while one muscle is relaxing, the other is, you know, contracting. That is how it, is, that is how it works. So, observing the changes in any muscle, that is, that is the change that is happening in muscles. While doing any work, while, you know, uh, even lifting a dumbbell also. You must be watching on TV like, you know, people bodybuilding or doing gymnastics. You can see that the muscles are relaxing and contracting in a very unusual way. Okay, while one, is, while one set of muscles is contracting, the other is expanding. Okay, that is how it happens. So now, the second kind... Uh, of contact forces that we are going to discuss is force of friction. Before we, you know, learn deeper into this topic, we need to understand two important points over here. Observing the motion of a ball on different surfaces. So, if I have two balls of the same mass and same size, like two marbles, uh, and I place one of them on a rougher surface, and I place the other on a smoother surface, and I strike both of them. When I strike both of them, uh, they are going to move to a certain length and uh, one might stop before the other one stops. So what? which one do you think is going to stop first? Of course the ball which is moving on the rougher surface is going to stop first when compared to the ball which is moving on the smoother surface. Okay, definitely they are going to stop at a certain point. They are not always forever going to move. There is a certain amount of limiting force which is going to stop the ball from moving. This limiting force or resisting force is called as friction. Now you need to remember a very important point that the marble on the rougher flow or the rough surface is going to stop before when compared to the marble which is moving on the smoother surface. So here that's the first point that we have discussed and the second one is observing the motion of objects on an inclined plane. You understand what is an inclined plane? So basically we must have studied it last time when we were studying uh, you know the seesaw and the inclined plane all these things okay if i place a brick over here it is going to incline and fall down these are also used in hospitals and all where you know people who are disabled and they are on wheelchair they can't climb steps so they have a certain inclined plane to you know move forward with the help of another person who's pushing them you know, you get the point. So that's what I'm trying to discuss over here. So observing the motion of an, of objects in an inclined plane. If I take, you know, a tray which and place it in an inclined position and I place a coin, an eraser and an ice cube. Okay. So I need to observe which of them is going to travel faster. Okay. This figure is already there in the textbook. I have mentioned the figure number, figure number 6. Please open up there. So you can observe that there are three objects which are sliding over the inclined surface and you need to observe which one travels the fastest as per the figure. It is the ice cube which is going to travel the fastest because it has the most smooth surface when compared to the coin and the eraser. Okay, eraser is the rubber or the pencil eraser that you are going to use to you know erase your... Uh, pencil writing that you write in your textbook and notebook. So what conclusion do we come to? The smoother the surface, the more the traveling part, the more it is going to travel. To stop it, the surface or the object needs to be rougher. 
Okay, that is what we come into. So the next thing that we are going to discuss is about frictional force. So yeah, coming to the other types of contact forces, let's discuss friction once more. Friction is nothing but the limiting force or the resisting force that is going to cause a moving object to stop. Okay, while you're traveling in your car with your dad and your dad is going to apply brakes to the car, the car is going to stop. You notice that the surface of the road is quite rough. That is why the car stopped easily while applying the brakes. Uh, while you're riding your bicycle and you're going on a, you know, even surface, very smooth surface and you try to stop, but you, you know, might slip or fall down because the road because the surface that on which you are moving is actually very even and very smooth so for friction to happen the surfaces need to be rough so what do we mean over here for the vehicles or for the bicycle that you were riding to stop the surface of the road needs to be a little rougher so that you know it is stopping at a proper point Okay, so friction is the limiting or the resisting force that is causing the moving object to stop. Remember this part. So you might have also noticed that, you know, sometimes uh, when you buy new shoes over some months, after a few months, you would look at the soles of the shoes. They are all worn out. Otherwise, when you buy them brand new, uh, they have certain grooves on them. Why do you think they have grooves? So for better grip while you're walking. Once you are using them again and again every day, you see that they get worn out and they become flat and you find difficulty while you know walking in those shoes because you start slipping whenever you wear them or whenever you run on, run with, by wearing them. Okay, so they need to have certain grooves. Coming to the next part, we have normal force over here. So here, if I consider I am placing on a table a book, Okay, fine. If I'm placing on the table a book over here, as we all know that every object on the Earth's surface is going to exhibit the gravitational force because of the gravitational pull of the Earth. Where is the gravitational force? It is pulling it downward. What is what is it pulling? The book, the table, it is pulling it downwards. Okay, so if this book slides and falls down, it is definitely go going to go down. It is not going to go up. That is all because of the gravitational force. Like the book is uh, going to fall down once it slides from the table. Okay, so there is one force acting on the book on the table that is gravitational force. There is one more force which is acting on the book which is placed on the table and that is called as the normal force. Now what is normal force? You see I have placed the book on a table. Okay, that is why the book is not falling down. So the table is supporting the book from falling down. So this force is acting perpendicular in direction upwards. This force is called as normal force which is not allowing the book to fall down. Both of these forces are equal and opposite in direction. That is why the book is said to be at rest. Do you get it? Both these forces, the gravitational force and the normal force, are equal and opposite in direction. And that only because of this, they cancel out each other. And the resultant force is nothing but rest. That is why the book is not moving from its position. If any of these two forces are greater than the other, you will see a certain motion in the book. This means somebody is sliding the book or sliding the table. Do you understand? Let's recollect it. What are we talking about? There are two forces which are being uh, you know, exerted on the book over here. One being the gravitational force which actually pulls the substances downwards. The other being normal force which is resisting. Which is uh, uh, exhibited by a solid surface over here which is nothing but the table. And is preventing the book from falling down. And it is acting vertically upwards. Okay, now what did I say you? The normal force and the gravitational force are equal and opposite to each other. So because they're equal and opposite to each other, they are going to cancel out each other. Okay, once they cancel out each other, the motion of the book is zero. This means the book is at rest. Any of them is greater than each other or dominates the other. Uh, this means the book is in motion or sliding on the table. Do you get my point over here? Okay, that's all about normal force. Now we are going to discuss about tension. Okay, not the usual examination tension that you get while uh, writing exams. This is a different kind of tension that is going to be exhibited by the objects that you see around yourself. Okay, so you need to remember 
again the point that every object on the earth's surface is going to exert uh, is going to have a gravitational pull towards the earth so now if i have a certain you know point in my ceiling where i'm going to attach a certain string to this string i'm going to attach a block okay this particular block is going to exhibit gravitational force of course every object is going to exhibit gravitational force along with gravitational force it is also going to exhibit tension now we need to understand what do we mean by tension in the string okay so here you see that the block is being held with the help of a string on a ceiling point it is the string because of which it is still hanging okay if i keep increasing the mass over here or if i attach a bigger block there is a possibility that the string is going to break so here the tightness okay or the weight that is borne by the string is called as the tension in the string this means how much the string can withstand how much amount of strength does the string have to hold the block for a certain period of time until it breaks so the for example if i'm holding a rope in my hand and i'm pulling it as much as possible till it breaks okay the tightness of the rope or the string is called as tension in the string so here also how much weight or how much you know uh, strength it can withstand the string can withstand is called as the tension in the string if i increase the mass if initially it was just 10 kgs and the string was easily able uh, able to handle it okay able to hold it at a certain position i increase the load i change the block i put some you know 70 kgs over here so do you think the string is going to be uh, going to handle just because it is really thin one okay it is going to break into two so you know there is a certain limiting point of every substance which it can withstand which you know it can hold to a certain level so summing it up what was i having over here we have a ceiling point on which we attach a string to which we attach a certain mass of 10 kg which is okay not that heavy because the string might be a little tighter one or it's let's consider let's consider just 2 kgs okay the string is able to handle perfectly okay so the tightness of the string or the weight that the string is able to withhold or withstand is called as tension in the string so i hope you guys are clear about all this okay definitely read the textbooks we have figure number 9 which can help you to understand what was i actually talking about further we have an experiment to show how does tension work hope you get are clear about it in the further video So now continuing with the tension topic over here we are going to discuss with the help of an experiment i have a spring balance over here which is going to give me the readings of the force that is going to be used and then i have certain amount of weight attached over here this there is a certain you know string which is mentioned as per the textbook to be of 10 cm length okay this is the string that i'm talking about so now with the help of the hanger i'm attaching a weight to the spring balance and i'm noting how much force is being applied over them okay so i keep adding weights what is going to happen now as i keep adding weights the string is going to break do you understand there is a certain limit to which the string can actually handle that certain limiting limiting force is called as tension that reading will be noted with the help of the spring balance that is what is going to give us the limiting force or tension which the particular strength can which which the particular string will be able to handle i repeat it again it is a very simple setup we have a spring balance over here and with the help of a string and hanger i am attaching a weight a very minute amount of weight which it was easily able to handle initially now i am going to replace the weight or add more weight if i keep adding more weight the string is going to break the point at which the string is breaking is actually telling me the strength of the string the strength of the string here is nothing but the tension or the limiting force which will be noted down with the help of the spring balance let's please go through it so now another concept that we are going to discuss about is net force so net force is nothing but the sum of all the forces acting on a body remember the table activity that we were doing we were having a table which uh, on which there was a book placed 
Okay. Fine. Now, what were the forces exhibited by the book? There were two forces. One was the gravitational force. The other uh, were was the normal force. These were the two forces which were acting upon the book. Okay. These are the two forces which are acting on the book and both of them are in opposite direction. So, if I sum them up, the resultant value that I'm going to get is zero. Do you understand? Because they're equal and opposite. It's like, you know, one plus minus one. So, it is one minus one giving you a zero. That is why the book is kept at rest. One Newton could be the force, normal force, which is acting on the book. And the other one Newton can be the gravitational force acting on the book. And because they are opposite in direction, I have a minus on one of the ones over there. So here, one of the forces is going to be negative and the other is going to be positive because they're equal and opposite. When I sum them up, one plus minus one is going to give me zero. That is why the book is not moving. Okay, so the net force in this case happens to be how much? Zero. Now let's deal with further examples where the force, one of the forces can be dominating over the other force. For example, there was a table in a class and uh, I want to push it. Okay, the table is very heavy. So I am not able to push it. Okay, so here uh, the net force is zero because the table is still at rest because I, was, I wasn't able to move it. So I ask two or three students to come along and uh, help me to push the table. So when I start pushing the table with the help of few students, I noticed that it was easily moving. So you see over here, on one end, if I increase the amount of force applied on a certain object, the object starts moving. Similarly, if there is a table placed over here, I stand on one side of the table and somebody stands on the other side of the table and both of us are pushing the table. Is the table going to move in this case? No, it is not going to move from its position because equal amount of force is being applied on both the ends. Okay, and it is equal. So this means if equal amount of force is applied on the opposite ends, the position of the object remains unchanged. Okay, these were the two cases. In the first case, I was alone pushing the table and the table was very hard to push. So I asked help. That is why, because of the help of our students, I was able to push the table while all of us were pushing it from one end only. In the second case, I was pushing the table from one end and somebody else was pushing the table from the other end. So if I, the table is placed over here, I am pushing from this end and you are pushing from the other end, okay? And uh, we are not able to move the table because both of us are applying equal amount of force. Do you understand now? If equal amount of forces are applied from the opposite ends, the object remains at rest. That is what I wanted to explain. So now, effects of net force acting on a table, that part is done. Effects of stretched rubber bands on fingers. If I take a rubber band in my fingers and I try to stretch them, I exhibit, you know, I f uh, feel a certain amount of force acting on my fingers, okay? There's, uh, you know, you can also observe certain lines because of the, you know, stretched rubber bands. There's only one rubber band that I'm stretching. If I, you know, on the same part, if I am going to place two or three rubber bands and I try pulling them apart, you will notice that, you know, pulling or stretching one rubber band was easier when compared to stretching five rubber bands. Okay, stretching five rubber bands is going to take larger amount of force when compared to one rubber band. So as the number of rubber bands increase, the force also increases. For example, this, uh, you know, the force applied to stretch one rubber band was F. Okay, I have only one rubber band. I'm trying to stretch it. The force applied by me is only F. So now, if I put one another rubber band over it, this means I'm increasing the force now. The force increased will be F, giving it me how much? 2F. This means it is twice the force that I need to use when I'm going to stretch two rubber bands to pull them apart. Okay, it keeps on increasing as you keep on increasing the number of rubber bands. One thing that you need to note down is that the unit of force is nothing but Newton. Okay. So now we need to learn how to calculate the net force with the help of a free body diagram, which is also abbreviated as an FBD. Okay, you can check this on page number 12. So you're going to compare this diagram with the x and the y axis. This 
horizontal part portion will be considered as the x-axis and the vertical one will be considered as the y-axis. You need to compare it with the diagram over here and we need to learn what are the forces acting on this particular free body over here. So as you can see there is a man who is trying to drive a car and we need to learn about what are the forces which are being you know acting upon this particular object as well as the person. So here force applied by the engine. So as soon as the man starts the engine, the car moves forward. So the force applied by the engine over here is written as capital F. Okay, now as he's going to apply the brakes so that the car does not skid, the road has a rougher surface and that, so, you know, force exhibited by or applied by the road is nothing but the frictional force which is exhibited or, you know, denoted as small f over here. So capital F is the force applied by the engine and small f is the frictional force or force applied by the road or the frictional force applied by the road. So now we have two tires also over here which are helping the car not to fall down directly. So they're acting vertically upward, perpendicular perpendicularly upward so n1 and n2 are the normal forces exhibited by the tires and then i have w which is nothing but the gravitational force you know acting upon on the body so that it is on the road and not flying at a certain level okay it is being pulled down because of the earth's gravity let's look at this points over here force applied by the engine is capital f Friction applied by the road is small f. The normal forces by the tires which are helping the car not to fall down are n1 and n2. Gravitational force is nothing but the weight of the body over here, okay, which is w, which is acting downward, okay. So f net x, we need to calculate the force along the x axis. So along the x axis, what else do we have? We have both the f over here, the capital and the small f, and they're equal and opposite in direction. Can you see the arrows going in the opposite direction over here? That is why we have written as small f minus capital F. That is the net force along x axis. Now we need to calculate the net force along y axis, which is nothing but the sum of the normal forces and the gravitational force. As I told you, they are also equal and opposite in direction. So N1 plus N2 minus W. Did you get my point over here? N1 and N2 are the normal forces exhibited by the tires and W is the weight of the body or the gravitational pull you know, towards the earth itself. And they are being summed up. This is basically plus minus W because this is opposite in direction. Do you see them? Do you see the arrows of normal forces and the W opposite in direction? That is what we are up to. So we need to talk about what forces can do. Okay, what the pulling and pushing on a particular object can actually do to that particular object. So the first point that we discuss over here is effective force on the change of state of motion of an object and its direction. So for example, you're in a playground with your friends and you are, you know, passing the ball and playing the basketball. Okay, so initially you, one player passes the ball to the other and the ball is moving very slowly. So as the game, uh, you know, moves on, as the game passes by, as time passes by and everybody is joining each other in playing, you can see that the ball is moving much more faster now. Okay, so the more force applied over the ball, the more is going to be the motion of the ball. It is going to be faster when compared to the step one. Okay, do you understand my point? Similarly, if you are in the flow of writing something, then your speed increases gradually. Similarly, the motion of the object also increases gradually when somebody is applying more amount of force. The second point that we discuss over here is effect of net force in the direction of moving object. For example, if you had a carom board in front of you and you were playing carom with your friends and you are a striker and you strike the coin. So while you're striking the coin, you see that, you know, it goes in a certain direction. Okay, now whosoever turn is next, the second boy, the second girl is going to strike the coin again. Is it going to go in the same direction? No, it is going to change its direction depending on where the person is sitting. Okay, uh, depending on the four corners of the carom board, where the person sits, it depends on that place. Also, how is he positioning his finger? So, you know, 
strike the coin so the striker coin is going to change its position every time the striker is going to strike the coin okay every time you push the coin it is going to have a different direction so basically we conclude that there is going to be a change in position change in the motion and the further one further effect of force is going to be the change in effect of size and shape okay one so the third and the final effect of force on a body is the change in the shape okay the change can be either permanent or temporary for example stretching a rubber band it is a temporary change so please write t over there squeezing a sponge it is also temporary because it can you know once you release the sponge it is going to regain its shape so it is also temporary and tearing a paper once i tear the paper into two halves can i rejoin it back and you know is it going to look as same as the original no it is a permanent change so breaking a piece of chalk of course again permanent you can't rejoin it and get the original one back making a chapati of course once you make a chapati are you going to get the flower back no it is also a permanent change breaking a glass what do you think this is this is also permanent change okay so now we are going to discuss about a new concept over here which is pressure okay so here you know for example uh, i have a marker in my hand and i try to poke the marker on the palm of my left hand okay uh, now if i turn it and i use the blunt head the blunt portion of the marker and try poking on my palm now you do it with your pencil in which case do you observe more pressure of course from the pointed end from when you are poking the pencil with the pointed end or the sharp end on your palm you are able to feel more pressure because the area of contact is much lesser when compared in second case do you get my point now take the sharp knife take the sharp knife it is you know having a very sharp end if you are going to cut an apple with a sharp end it is much easier okay so lesser the area of contact more is the pressure and the apple gets cut very easily now if i take a blunt knife a knife that is not sharp is called as a blunt knife and i try cutting with the help of a blunt knife so when i cut it with the help of a blunt knife it is not going to get cut into two halves because the pressure is not appropriate now look at these two bricks over here i take two bricks you know of equal size and shape and weight and i have two trays of sand over here the only difference here is i'm going to throw one brick you know vertically and the other brick in some horizontal position okay so when i throw them which one goes deeper of course the first brick is going to go deeper because the area of contact here is lesser okay the area of contact here is lesser with the sand tray or the surface of the sand that is why the pressure is much more okay here the area of contact is much larger so that is why the pressure is much lesser so we come to a formula p is equal to f by a where p is the pressure force is the force is denoted by f and a denotes the area of contact the lesser the area of contact the more is the pressure the more is the area of contact the lesser is the pressure that is why in this case because there is less area of contact the brick is sinking deeper and in this case it is not sinking deeper okay so the units of force are newton and the units of area are meter square so this sums up that the units of pressure are going to be newton per meter square okay so now remember this point that pressure and area of contact are inversely proportional to each other remember when i am poking the pencil with the sharp end it is going to give me more pressure and while i poke it with the blunt end it is going to give me lesser pressure okay now with the sharp knife also a sharp knife is going to cut the apple much better when compared to a blunt knife now here also you need to understand the vertical brick is going to sink deeper when compared to the horizontal brick